I would just like to welcome you to tonight's ISCAST and New Zealand Christians in Science fifth conversation in the current series. Um, I'm hoping that you're all enjoying some freedoms that we're enjoying here in Melbourne now, um, wherever you are located. Um, I'm Sarah, I'm the Program Director for ISCAST and I'd like to introduce He's already introduced himself, the Reverend Dr. Chris Mulheron, who's the Executive Director of his cast. Say hi, Chris. Hi, and uh, Dr. Nicola Hoggard Cregan, the Co Director of New Zealand Christians in Science. And Nicola will be taking over from me in just a moment. But I will remind you of a few things. Um, if you've been enjoying these evenings lately, could you please tell others about them? And we'd also like to hear some feedback. So please shoot us an email and we'll encourage you to be, uh, to be frank, to be honest with us, because we really value your opinions. Um, we'd ask that you would keep yourselves on mute. And if you have a question, we'd like you to type it into the chat and Nicola will let you know when to unmute. And then you can ask your question directly to our speaker. So I will just uh, welcome Nicola and she'll be taking over from things now and facilitating the discussion. Thank you, Sarah, and tēnā koutou katoa. On behalf of New Zealand Christians and Science, um, welcome from us also, and from um, a still lockdown Auckland. Um, so this time, let me introduce a mathematician, Gray Manicom. Gray is a South African completing a PhD in mathematics at the University of Auckland. Um, with an interest in dynamical systems and heteroclinic networks. And if you don't know what those are, then he may well enlighten us um, today. He and his partner, Janae, were a part of a discussion group we held pre-COVID at McLaurin Chapel. Gray is also a pianist. He loves cricket, movies, and talking about ideas which we hope to do tonight. So welcome, Gray. And um, just before you start though, um, Sylvia is going to pray for us. Sylvia, thank you. Lord bless mathematicians and scientists, theologians and all thinkers great and small, that we may take account of you first and foremost. May we take into account those who count for little in our world, May we count our blessings and number our sorrows. May we hold our hands empty with nothing at all of our own. And may we grow little by little into your mighty, infinite love. Will we ask your blessing on this evening and our conversation, open our minds more and more and uh, bless Gray as he talks. Great. <clears throat> Thank you for that wonderful introduction and wonderful prayer. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen. So today I'm going to be um, talking a bit about mathematics and Christianity. And this is obviously a very big topic. Um, I suppose I decided to go a bit more broad than deep in terms of the content matter. So I'm going to be focusing on two particular questions. The first question is, how does what we think about mathematics influence our worldview and our lives in today's society? And the second question is, how is this different to the perhaps familiar topic of science and Christianity? And I kind of wanted to include this second part because I feel like in the forum like this, a lot of us will be quite familiar with, say, the science and Christianity topic and uh, know quite a lot about those themes. But mathematics is actually quite different to science in a number of different ways. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about that as we go along um, and how those differences might change how we relate to things in our worldview, things about how we behave and approach um, mathematical influences in today's society. To begin with, I'm gonna have a very brief historical context um, leading up to today's context, and then I'll tackle these two questions kind of in reverse order. So <clears throat> looking at the historical context, kind of going way back in time, uh, Eva Gratton Guinness, a historian of mathematics, says this, two deep and general points about ancient cultures are often underrated, that people saw themselves as part of nature 
and mathematics was central to life. These views stand in contrast to modern ones, in which nature is usually regarded as an external area for problem solving, and mathematicians are often treated as mysterious outcasts removed from polite intellectual life. Well, I don't feel like a mysterious outcast, so thank you very much for inviting me to partake in this polite intellectual discussion. Um, but I think uh, what, what Ivo is getting at here is that in ancient cultures, especially, um, say, European, Middle Eastern cultures, Persia, um, places, places like that, mathematics was, was central to many things. And there was certainly no kind of separation between mathematics and theology and religious beliefs. And this kind of leads right up to just before the Enlightenment. Um, I'm gonna briefly discuss three uh, really great mathematicians who are all alive at the same time, right at the turn of the 17th century. The guy on the left is John Napier. He was a Scottish mathematician. Um, and he, a part of his maths, he invented the logarithm. Um, but what he considered his greatest work was a, a work called A Plain Discovery of the Whole Revelation of St. John's. Um, and in this work, he uses mathematics and mathematical principles to predict the end of the world, the apocalypse, which he got wrong, I'm quite happy to say, otherwise none of us would be around right now. In the middle, we have Johannes Kepler, a uh, very famous. Uh, he wrote a book called Mysterium, and it was a theological work full of Bible passages and theology, um, arguing for a heliocentric uh, solar system with the sun at the middle and the earth not at the middle. And although this was um, designed as a kind of theological work, it contained a lot of mathematical principles and a lot of mathematical arguments that he then later published in what would become Kepler's Laws of Planetary Motion, a kind of foundation of astronomy for many years after that. The one I'm going to focus on the most is this one on the right, um, René Descartes. Uh, he wrote a work called Meditations. Um, in it, he uh, made a mathematical argument for the existence of God. Um, he was a really great mathematician, and his main focus and his main contribution revolved around bringing Greek axiomatic ge geometry into other fields. So in uh, Greek geometry, there was this kind of way of proving things using an axiomatic system, where one would begin with a few axioms or base assumptions that seemed really self-evident, like there was no ways that they weren't true. And you would assume those and then use mathematical arguments to prove everything upwards from that. So you'd start with this uh, foundation of as few assumptions as possible and build up from there. Descartes took this um, idea of um, axioms and used it in philosophy, where he would assume as little as possible and then build up from there, leading to his famous statement, I think, therefore, I am, as his first axiom. Um, in terms of mathematics, he's famous for um, the Cartesian plane, probably most of all, uh, which gets its name from him. That's the X and Y axes that I'm sure we're all quite familiar with. He used that to um, describe the fight of cannonballs because he could now um, take algebra, which was Arabic, and geometry, which was Greek, and combine them into what is now called algebraic geometry. And so geometrical shapes were given equations, basically. And he could do, um, say, the flight of cannonballs and projectiles and, and these sorts of things using this new type of mathematics. My thing is not, sorry. Okay. From Descartes until now, we see kind of two trends. And I'm using Descartes as a exam an example of how these kind of began, um, although it's not obviously entirely up to him. The first trend is that mathematics um, gets applied a lot, a lot more to what I'll call terrestrial physics. Before Descartes, before the Enlightenment, most mathematics uh, was either in currency, uh, that's where most of algebra came from, or in art, uh, that was a lot of the emphasis of geometry, 
all in astronomy. Um, but from Descartes looking at cannonballs flying uh, onwards, the emphasis became much more on things that we actually interact with in day-to-day -day lives. Um, here I have a picture of honeycomb and one of the kind of famous recent theorems, recently proved theorems was the honeycomb conjecture, which said that the best way to cover a surface um, with as minimal work as possible is worth hexagons, which is why bees use them when making honey. The other trend we see is not particularly within mathematics, but within philosophy. And that was the fact that Descartes' uh, kind of rationalism that he started, he's called the father of modern philosophy, um, ultimately led to positivism and um, kind of enlightenment principles. And this led to a kind of separation of mathematics and theology. Um, so mathematics plus positivism is kind of equal to mathematics without theology, um, where the kind of, let's say, the natural assumption that mathematics and uh, theology went hand in hand was set aside because when you're assuming as little as possible, you don't need to assume that God exists and mathematics kind of built up from there. And so positivism and rationalism found a real home in mathematics and vice versa. And they kind of continued together for a long period of time. That doesn't mean that they weren't Christian mathematicians, of course not. It just means that most of their work separated the two. Coming up to today's context, rationalism and positivism uh, generally seem to be on the decline. I think most people in my generation find uh, rationalism to be a bit too cold, um, a bit too lacking in empathy for uh, human lived experiences, for stories, um, for the transcendental values, which we all live by and which we all hold dear. And we also see that mathematics is on the rise in society. We have technology becoming more and more uh, mathematics-based. We have information becoming more and more key and important. Most of it's stored using mathematical principles or transferred using mathematical principles. And importantly, I think we see that most of the other sciences are also becoming more mathematical. Um, I work in, as Nicola was saying, heteroclinic networks, but what I use those mathematical tools for is to model cognitive processes, where 50 years ago, um, I feel like psychology did not have much of a mathematical grounding. Nowadays, psychology has a very heavy mathematical grounding, um, as we've come to understand more and more. Likewise, theoretical physics um, is almost entirely mathematical, um, so much so that many math departments have been combined with theoretical physics departments so that they become one unit and experimental physics becomes its own thing. So this rise of mathematics um, and kind of gives rise to the, the obvious first question, how are we going to live in this increasingly mathematical world? And like I said at the beginning, I feel like in this kind of forum, perhaps um, we're familiar with some of the ideas around science and Christianity. And so I wanted to take a moment to think about what mathematics is and how is it different to science? In this little picture, I have some mathematical objects on the left. Uh, we have an equation, we have a perfect cube, and we have a matrix which contains complex numbers, um, which are even less um, easy to picture than the real ones. And on the right, we have physical things that we can touch, that we can interact with. So when talking about mathematics, there's really something quite mysterious about it. And I have this little Kelvin and Hobbes comic that I'll give you all a moment to read. So I really like this comic and um, 
it raises some good points and particularly it raises the question for me of why don't maths atheists actually exist um i feel like they should but i've never come across someone who calls himself a math a maths atheist and i think the reason perhaps they should is because numbers aren't real we don't interact with them or experience them in the same way in which we interact with or experience other things in science if we're dealing with um at bricks or whatever you can pick up a brick and you can throw it but you can't pick up the number two and throw it um, you don't see positive gradients climbing up holes or negative gradients rolling down them and so although mathematical objects might be real as many uh, mathematicians believe they're not real in the same way as which say atoms which you also can't see are real and we don't experience mathematics in the same way and another very mysterious thing about mathematics is that it actually works. Um, by that, I mean that it explains things that aren't mathematical themselves. For example, um, quantum mechanics is a whole field basically um, justified through mathematics and nothing else. Yet the objects within quantum mechanics are not mathematical objects. They are electrons and protons and quarks and all sorts of things that aren't mathematical themselves. And so it's kind of surprising or it's kind of mysterious that mathematical objects should give us so much information about non-mathematical objects, given that the mathematical objects themselves seem to be things that we come up with as we go along. Two particular um, parts of mathematics that are different, apart from just the, the sheer mystery of it. Um, the one is that math tends to deal with abstract objects. Um, in this little picture, we have physical things on the left. And as we go along to the right, we make those things more and more abstract. Um, just like in abstract art, where abstract art distills the defining features of things we can see, Mathematics distills the defining features of patterns. In a science paper, um, you might have a long methodology, which gives you a lot of very detailed information about the temperature or the pressure of the room in which the experiment was done and the exact environments. There are a lot of specifics to take into account when doing science and doing it well. But with mathematics, we completely veer in the opposite direction. We don't care that much about the particular details. Um, as William Lane Craig writes in his book, abstraction is subtraction. You are removing, say, the fur of the dog and his name and these sorts of things who his owners are and becoming more and more abstract, distilling down to certain patterns or certain general representations that don't apply just to that dog, but apply to all dogs, or perhaps to all mammals, or perhaps to all animals, or perhaps just to everything that has four legs, um, or perhaps just to the number four. And so mathematics uh, tends to veer away from the abstract, while science often tends to veer towards the specific. Another key difference is that science has to do mostly with causation. The types of questions that scientists generally are trying to answer are questions of how things happen, how they work. Um, for example, when an apple falls off the tree, the scientist will say that happens because of gravity. However, in mathematics, we don't have causation in the same way. The explanations we are trying to give are not explanations of what caused something, but different types of explanations. Um, in the words of G.K. Chesterton, if the apple, apple hit Newton's nose, Newton's nose hit the apple. That is a true necessity, because we cannot conceive of the one occurring without the other. But we can well conceive the apple not falling on its nose. We can fancy it flying ardently through the air to hit some other nose of which it had a more definite dislike. We have always had in our fairy tales kept the sharp distinction between the signs of mental relations in which there really are laws and the science of physical facts in which there are no laws, but only weird repetitions. What I would say here is that he's calling the science of physical facts what most of us would consider to be science. Uh, and he's saying there are no laws here because 
if you can imagine something different happening, um, then it then there isn't a strong mental relation, and we shouldn't necessarily expect that thing to always happen the same way. He calls that just a weird repetition. But he also has the science of mental relations and mathematical principles for Chesterton would fall into this category, where we can't even imagine those things not being true. He uses the example of the apple hitting Newton's nose, but you could also imagine one plus one apple being two apples. We cannot picture the first apple being added to the second apple and that not being two apples. And as we apply other mathematical laws and principles to that, we also find that we cannot imagine anything else being true. Um, this is the general role of mathematical proof, which is to make a statement unimaginably, when, when, when a statement is mathematically true, it's unimaginable that anything else could be true. My button, there you go. In the words of Mark Cullivan, he writes, mathematical explanations typically tell us not only that the world is thus and so, but in a very important sense, it had to be thus and so. So science deals with causes, what causes something to be. In mathematics, generally mathematical statements just are. Nothing causes them to be that way. I now go to the primary question, which is how our understanding of mathematics affects our lives and our worldview. And I've broken this into two different um, categories. Uh, the first is so social conversations, and the second is theological conversations. And obviously in the conversation we have after I'm done, you can ask many more questions about these. Beginning with the social con uh, conversation, I want to emphasize that our society is extremely mathematical, not just in the technology that we use, but indeed all other fields of science are becoming more and more reliant on mathematics um, in terms of mathematics explanatory power. But in society, we also um, have particular topics that concern the way we live and the way we move forward. One might be systemic inequality, these are two pictures that I uh, took walking around the Department of Mathematics at the University of Auckland um, on people's doors, or one was in a lecture hall. The first says, mathematics knows no races or geographic boundaries. For mathematics, the cultural world is one country. And the other says, mathematics is designed by a white man for the benefit of white men. And these very, two very different perspectives of mathematics change whether mathematics is a tool to unify us or a tool to continue dividing us. In education, um, here I have a graph of people's annual earnings for different things that they studied and different fields they work in. Uh, at the top, we have the purple line, that's mathematics and statistics, which makes me feel pretty good about my life choices. Um, at the bottom, we have theology and religious vocations. Obviously, there are many other ones I could have included, but I just chose these four categories. We have environmental science, and you see that mathematics and statistics, other, field, other STEM fields like engineering, computer science, generally they earn a lot more um, over the course of their careers. And a the natural question then is, what will this do to society if everyone's studying STEM fields and no one's studying art or music education or no one's being paid for it? And I would say that the funding situation um, in academia is quite similar. It's relatively or comparatively easy to get funding to do a PhD in mathematics like I'm doing compared to a PhD in something like history where there's not as much funding. In terms of government policy, uh, this is a screenshot I took from the COVID take control simulator, which you can Google and play with. Um, this is a tool developed by the people who are modeling COVID in New Zealand and advising government. Um, and around the world, we've been seeing that people are relying on mathematical models in order to um, inform government policy and decision-making. 
a popular topic at the moment is intelligence, whether that's from artificial intelligence or from, uh, say, implants in human intelligence or enhancements made to humans. And in essence, what these are, are can numbers encode feeling or consciousness or enhance feeling or consciousness, maybe enhance memory? Um, and so there's a lot of interest where the mathematical tools uh, or mathematical objects can actually capture, encode, or ultimately be conscious or intelligent. And finally, data. Um, obviously, privacy is a big thing, um, which leads to, uh, say, big data is leading to targeted adverts and things like this. So how much can these numbers and algorithms manipulate us, reveal us, or protect us? Since almost all this is done purely by algorithms without uh, human intervention, the algorithm is set up and it runs. And in essence, it's a mathematical um, equation, as it were, that's manipulating us and revealing all sorts of things about us. And it's also mathematical algorithms that protect us in terms of encryption and privacy. And it's really interesting that we have um, say all these topics, and obviously these are just a few examples, and yet the common person does not necessarily know exactly what mathematics is or have a common understanding of what mathematics is. I think if you ask a layman on the street, um, they'd have a pretty good idea what a scientific experiment is, but would have a very difficult time explaining what a mathematical proof is. And yet all these things, uh, all these topics, are impacted by mathematics in its purer sense. Um, and yet people don't have a kind of common understanding of what that means. Um, in terms of theological conversations we might have, here's a, a kind of well-known far side comic um, of God at his computer. And I kind of like this image, it might be um, bad theology. But I think it emphasizes how, how important mathematics has become that one could show God sitting at a computer and it, it would make sense. <laughs> um, that just shows the, the power, I think, of, of where we've come um, with mathematical devices like computers. Um, so that's the far side. But I want to focus on the God side, the human side, and the both sides. Um, Paul de Rock said this, God used beautiful mathematics in creating the world. And I think when it comes to theology, um, there's a really interesting thing for me of, did God create mathematics or is mathematics part of his nature? And I've never actually come across uh, an answer to that question in my reading anyway. Um, there's a, a kind of strong sense, I think, of, amongst people, say scientists and mathematicians, that um, mathematics, it seems to exist in and of itself. It has a kind of existence that seems uh, separate to the existence of physical things, because it's not a physical thing itself. And this kind of creates an impression that perhaps it would exist without the physical universe existing. And if that were the case, perhaps it's part of God um, and not something that he created. Um, as this quote would suggest. From the human side of things, I think like with all creative endeavors, when we do mathematics, we manifest God's image in a particular way. But apart from that, we also have questions we can ask. Why can we do mathematics? Should we do mathematics? Why does mathematics reveal to us that which our senses does not? And do we create the mathematics or do we discover it? And what would it mean in terms of our relationship with God if those were to change from creating to discovering? And finally, uh, the both sides, there's a, a, a brilliant article by uh, Sarah Voss and she talks about metaphors, which are mathematical concepts and ideas that have become commonplace um, say in theology or philosophy or elsewhere, and how um, the mathematical understanding gets 
uh, in turn affected by the understanding from these other fields. These include things like dimension, zero infinity, randomness, chaos, entropy, prediction, proof, logic, contradiction, superposition, like Schrodinger's cat. This picture I have on the right is Salvador Dali's uh, painting of the crucifixion. And the cross here is a kind of high dimensional cross, as it were, to emphasize the fact that um, the crucifixion is, is, is in some sense a higher dimensional event that transcends space and time. And that would be a metaphor where a mathematical concept is being used here through the medium of art to describe a theological idea. And here we have a picture of Schrodinger's cat. Is it dead? Is it alive? Depends how you look at it or when you look at it or if you look at it. Um, and this kind of, this, this idea of superposition, um, hiding is uncertainty um, can now be found all over the place. Finally, uh, some references for continuing this conversation. Um, this is all just recommended uh, reading. At the bottom, there's the, the math of his article. Um, yeah, and uh, now I'd love to have a conversation with you. Uh, that was amazing. Great, thank you so much. I am sure that people will have lots of questions, but they might take a little while to dream them up. So in the meantime, um, I've got one. You've got one, who's that? Uh, oh, Carolyn, please, yes, yeah. go ahead. Yes. Um, this is a, um, an instant reaction without a huge amount of thought behind it, but one does tend to notice what appear to be direct contradictions. So at one point you said, um, nothing causes equations or mathematics to be, it just is. Is that correct? Did you say that or something like that? Mathematic, um, mathematics yeah. uh, is an independent metaphorical reality. Um, I would say that the, the type of things that mathematics is trying to explain or to answer are not causal things. So, um, it, and this is highlighting a difference between science and mathematics. So in science, you might say what caused the apple to fall to the ground. In mathematics, you wouldn't say what causes, um, say, a right angle triangle to have a longer hypotenuse than other sides. Um, it's just not the sort of explanation that mathematics is providing. Uh, I was thinking really of the nature of mathematics as, as um, an entity. It hasn't been invented, it just is, right? Um, that's very much open for debate. Personally, I would side more on the side that mathematics is invented, but then there's a lot of work to do as to explaining why it actually explains so much um, and reveals so much as an invented man-made, let's say, oh, and created right. thing. Uh, perhaps I misunderstood you. I thought you were saying that it was something that had always existed and we, we haven't invented it but we've discovered it and then in the next sentence just about you quoted or showed a, a, a photograph of a, a note which was on somebody's doorway in the math department at Auckland which said maths was invented by white men for white men was it roughly that yeah so um what I was showing at the end there in in both of those uh, things you're referring to I'll start with the first one. The first one was as a theological topic. Um, I think there is a sense, a, a feeling, let's say, or a common understanding that mathematics doesn't feel invented. And I think within mathematics, most people are happy to say that it's invented. Most people, um, though there's a lot of debate on that. Um, but at the same time, it's it's kind of, difficult to imagine somehow mathematics not being around. 
because of what I was saying, uh, uh, because of what G.K. Chesterton was talking about, it's, it's almost impossible for us to even imagine uh, mathematical rules being broken. For example, one plus one not being two. Yeah. Um, in the second one, uh, when I showed the, the pictures from the department, I was showing two sides, two sides of that argument. So on the one side, it was saying that it's a mathemat mathematics is invented by white people for the benefit of white people. But on the other side, it was basically saying mathematics isn't invented. It knows no uh, boundaries. Um, it's completely independent of human influence. Um, I don't think either of those statements are exactly true. Uh, I'm just kind of raising the question with that. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, these are very deep subjects that we could spend all night on. I'm certainly on the, on the side of those who, um, uh, that we are discovering mathematics. But um, Jeff, yeah. you okay, had a question. You. Yeah, we had a question and, and, um, and there's other questions are pouring in as well. So why don't you go first, Jeff? Unmute yourself. Yes, hi, uh, Gray. I just wanted to make um, an additional comment in relation to um, the, the fact that science is concerned with causal things, whereas mathematics is perhaps uh, non-causal. Um, the relationships, the causal relationships be between things within the scientific world are subject to the second law of thermodynamics. And generally they're entropy producing, whereas um, if you want to hold on to the idea of causal relationships in mathematics, uh, it's not entropy uh, producing, uh, you know? So um, there's no dissipation uh, within mathematical relationships, whereas there's always dissipation within um, <clears throat> real world relationships that science attempts to address. So I think that indicates that there is an, indeed a fundamental difference between uh, the two areas of investigation. Yeah, and the, the one thing I would simply add to that is um, in second year of physics, I remember proving somehow, although I can't remember how, the second law of thermodynamics. But the one thing I can definitely say is it was a mathematical proof. It wasn't one based on experiment and observation at all. And in a sense, I think that's why people trust it, because how would you ever trust an experimental observation of entropy? The experiment itself is, would by necessity be entropic and you know, uh, disorder would be increasing in the, in the system while the experiment was underway. So um, yeah, I think that again, this mass is, uh, performs a different role to the scientific method in questions like that. Thanks for that example. In that case, um, mathematics is obviously some sort of um, anticipation of the eschaton then, you know, when things do not decay. Uh, um, uh, yes. Let's go to Nick, shall we? Nick Menzies. Yeah, hi, hi, Gray. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, yeah, I like the idea that maths is actually uh, like a language. Um, and as you can appropriate more and more advanced mathematical techniques, you actually find more and more about our existence and the universe, not necessarily the physical universe, but, and like, for example, Dirac, who you talked about, he came to a conclusion about uh, antimatter uh, from mathematics. Um, a lot of the maths gave him the language to be able to talk about antimatter. But then in ancient times, you know, that about uh, zero's, uh, Zeno's paradox of motion, um, Achilles can never quite catch the tortoise because when the tortoise has a head start, because back there they didn't really have an idea of the infinitesimal. And so as we can understand that it came about through, I guess, Leibniz and, and uh, Newton. But um, yeah, do you think the societies do find that the, as they can appropriate more and more advanced mathematics, gives them greater and greater insights into actually the nature of God, because it's a more advanced language to talk about a more and more <laughs> advanced uh, person like God? Um. I would think so. I would think that's that's what that those kind of mathifers are getting at. Yeah. Um, there are some perhaps more apparent examples, maybe like infinity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the the tortoise, uh, Achilles tortoise example would be a great one where mathematically the missing infinity left it as a paradox, whereas you know, as you have uh, 
infinity and infin infinitesimals, then you can kind of talk about that paradox in a in a logical sound yeah. way. Yeah. Um, and obviously, the idea of infinity is closely linked to um, to God. Um, yeah. This was something Cantor, the set theorist, um, was quite big on. I think he wrote wrote quite a bit about um, how his kind of construction of set theory and infinity was influencing his view of God. Yeah. But I don't, I don't, I suppose in my mind anyway, it would take a while for these kind of mathematical concepts to filter through society all the way into a societal view of God. Although I, I think obviously eventually that must happen. Um, yeah, I mean, even, even things like zero as a number was, a uh, much later invention only came around about 900s um, in mm -hmm. India, and but but you can you can picture that kind of the zero as a number being a strong theme in in creation ex nihilo. So I think there's a backwards and forwards motion there. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Craig. But I, I would recommend um, Sarah Voss's article on Mathephys, which I I can give the reference for. Mm, thanks. Um, it's quite cool. Okay, Richard um, Milne, are you unmuted? Yes, I discovered myself again. <laughs> oh, good. That's excellent. <laughs> uh, thank you, Gray. That's very fascinating. I'm trying, trying to get my head around some of your thoughts. Um, this might sound strange, but I'm asking whether maths might be about relationships. I think of something like gravitational theory. You've got an inverse square law there. Um, something's going on which can be described by that law. Now, that law was always there, one presumes but uh, we haven't defined it. <laughs> so it's about the relationship between two objects, for example. And there must be many, many more examples about how mathematics is about relationships. So I think perhaps it could be. And if so, I ponder the question, could it exist without relationships, that is without a universe? And if not, what is it about? So um, I think it is very much about relationships. Um, when I think about, uh, so Bert, Bertrand Russell wrote a book called The Introduction to Modern Philosophy. And uh, it was kind of his much easier to read version of, of where he thought mathematics kind of built up from uh, starting with just numbers. And their relationships is one of the first things he talks about. In fact, he talks about relationships before numbers and he defines numbers in terms of relationships. And that can be demonstrated by saying this is one cup and this is one knife, dirty knife at that. Um, and so the oneness of these things, there's a kind of relationship between the cup and the, the knife. Um, and that gives one. And, and then you can define the number one in a formal way by these kind of relationships. Um, so yes, I do think the, the relationships, you know, even the fact that we can get numbers uh, from relationships, there's a relationship between the cup and the knife that is kind of deep and meaningful. There, there is oneness to both of them. That's a property of both the, the single knife and the single uh, cup. Obviously, as you go further, I think mathematics is interested in patterns and patterns come about through relationships. Um, but I, I, wouldn't, I would say also that not everything is, is just relationships. Um, because mathematics is constantly defining new ideas, new concepts, and new properties that don't necessarily have relationships to other mathematical ideas or concepts, or even relationships to anything tangible or physical. Um, in that sense, it's just, it's almost like a game that's being played somewhere else. And, and sometimes um, in a kind of usually quite surprising way, it might turn out that the results of that game actually do have relationships to other parts of mathematics or to uh, real life, but the intention of that mathematics isn't necessarily uh, about relationships itself. It's just about the objects and, and the rules of the game, as it were. Um, but yeah, uh, obviously relationships are, are incredibly important um, with that. Yeah, thank you. So perhaps you're saying there are two types of mathematics in a broad sense. One's about relationships, the other is a bit more abstract. You're saying that? Yes, I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, mathematics as applied to physical sciences generally 
is about forming relationships between things. My field of dynamic systems is how things evolve in time. That's the relationship between the thing and itself and time. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, I think the more applied the mathematics is, the more about relationships it is. Sure, thank you. Okay, all of these questions could be, you know, the subject of another lecture. Um, Antonios, do you want to give your, um, your question, please? Yeah, thanks very much for a great talk, Gray. Um, I, I, like you, I'm, I'm perplexed by this question of did God invent mathematics or create it, or, or is it somehow just there and God just uses it? And there seem to be two horns. So either God um, did create it, in which case it should be possible for it to be different. And, you know, God could have made the world so that one plus one equals three, but he chose not to. And that seems a very odd thing. But then the other horn is God didn't create it, but then that would mean there's something that exists independently of God. And that doesn't seem acceptable. And actually, as I, as I was um, waiting to ask my question, I, I struck upon a third possibility. Um, what if mathematics is in some way just a reflection of the essential nature of God? Um, so it's not created. Maybe when God is manifest in the world, he's not just the word, but he's also the number. <laughs> um, and, and I think the Greek word, you know, logos, probably admits of a much broader interpretation than, um, mm. you know, a verbal uh, you know, a word, it means something much more than that rationality generally. I, I wonder, do, does that sort of help at all in resolving that problem or or not? What do you think? Um, well, I tend to agree with, with the last one. Um, this is something, I, I read a book by William Lane Cray called God and Abstract Objects. Um, and in that in that book is, he basically, he he puts forward this idea that um, God is the only being with a satiety that should exist in and of, its, of itself. Um, and yet mathematics seems to have this kind of property of a satiety. Uh, he's not speaking particularly about mathematics, but ob abstract objects in general, but most of his examples are mathematical. Um, and he, in that book, he goes to great lengths to, let's say, explain that mathematics does not have the property of a satiety. And when I finished that book, I kind of came to the exact same thought that you had, but surely if holiness and love and these sorts of things, we don't say God created them differently, right? This is, um, what's that, Euthyprose? Is it Euthyprose? I don't know, but the old Greek thing, is, is it good because it's God or uh, God said so, or is uh, God saying it because it's good? Um, in my mind, it's God is a mathematician in that sense. Mathematics is part of him. Um, but the I suppose the trick with that then, for me personally, Nicola might find this a much easier to thing to to deal with, is when I sit down and I write down a mathematical theorem or I read a paper by someone who comes up with a new theorem. It's very difficult for me to understand where that theorem is actually coming from, because it very much seems like the person is writing it down. Um, and so I don't, I don't know if they're partaking in, in God directly in that moment or if they're just coming up with a mathematical theorem. And, and for me, that's not an easy thing to resolve. But I do think, I do think mathematics seems to be part of God's nature, um, not something that's created like the physical universe is created. There is that, it has a different um, that, nature. There is that, um, that film, The Man Who Knew Infinity, about the Indian... Um, mathematician who who got his theorems from the temple mm. did you see that yeah so he really did just get them out of nowhere um, yeah at least, at least from some deep intuition which he got in a temple context which is very interesting yeah and he didn't yeah. know the work he didn't know the working yeah it's, yeah it's and, and his theorems were so odd yeah. just from a mathematical point of view it's it's kind of unimaginable that he would have thought them up from intuition. I mean, obviously he was a very special character, but it's, if you, you can Google his formula for, for pi as an example, mm. and it's just a horrifying thing to look at. There's no sense of reasonableness about it at all. <laughs> like <laughs> from my, my perspective, nothing about it uh, feels right. 
and yet it works. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, there there is something mm -hmm. something kind of mysterious that seems to be happening there. Okay. Um, Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, let me see. Um, Hugh, do you want to give a, um, give your question? You can. I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions. Hugh, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Um, you have to. Sorry, you're, you're muted. Yeah. Q, are you still muted? We had this problem last time with you. Microphone, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Okay, yeah, I'll just try, try another microphone. Okay. So you can hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear okay, you. Okay, yeah, my question, my question there, um, the example I came across, it was not one plus one equals two, but two plus two equals four. I mean, it's the same thing, but just picking up, in the last four years with Donald Trump in power in America, a journalist comes up with the, you know, the observation that two plus two no longer equals four in Trump land um, because of the manipulation of maths, if you like. And that the question I have at the end of my comment there is, is this apparent political manipulation the future of maths? And will we lose the certainty that maths provides, particularly because it is being politicized? And what might that mean for the future of certainty well, I think that's a, a very good question. Um, I showed that that picture of the, the two photos I took in the math department, and there are, I think, clear political connotations to those two views, although, you know, maybe with one of them, it wouldn't seem so at first. Um, I don't think maths will lose its certainty. And part of the reason I say that is because mathematicians work very hard at being certain. Um, it is kind of our job in the sciences to be more certain than everyone else. Um, and I think as long as math professional mathematicians are around, that will keep being the case. But I think the, where the manipulation will happen is really in data. Um, and that's citizen data, targeted adverts, and then just bad representation of data. I mean, I've seen this so often now with, with COVID, we have read these um, articles that just just clearly misrepresent the statistics and a lot of this is is very simple stuff for example not having the axis start at zero but just having a line that looks really you know big or something or maybe that maybe two lines that look really far apart but it's only because you've zoomed into the bit where they're really close together yeah, um, yeah. So there, there definitely is a lot of manipulation of, of mass, but I don't think mass itself will lose certainty. I think the part of the difficulty is this disconnection between um, a common understanding of mathematics and actual mathematics, which yeah. I think is a very particular thing to the field of mathematics, at least in my experience. I, I don't think many people finish high school like I did having with very good grades in mathematics, obviously. I mean, I went on and studied it. But looking back, I had no idea what mathematics actually was or what well, I was doing. Or okay, what can, I, can I just, can I just um, give you some encouraging feedback for you? Um, the very issues that you've discussed in your very, uh, very helpful presentation, um, I was actually re wrestling with, with a, a year 12 class this very day in high school here in Auckland. Um, I teach theory of knowledge in the IB program, and we have a whole thing called maths as an area of knowing. And we're debating today very much whether, you know, how accurate does the number pi have to be? And so in year 12 maths, you only need four decimal places. Right. And one student pointed out that pi can, in fact, be infinite, infinite, I guess, and therefore does it actually exist if it's infinite? But we concluded that we only need pi to 25 decimal places because that's what NASA uses to put rockets on Mars. See, so, you know, um, yeah, so these are the types of things. So all your stuff that you're very, very passionate about, it does actually make its way out into society. So there you are, that's a bit of positive feedback for you. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. I'm glad that you're speaking to high schoolers about this because it's something that I've been, I'm very aware of. In fact, um, if you're in Auckland, uh, you come and speak at my school, please. I am in Auckland and I would love to do that. Okay, I we will... need to exchange email addresses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I can put you guys in touch with each other. Um, we can't get out of Auckland, so we might as well talk to each other. Um, 
So we really only have time for one more question and then we will finish. And then perhaps, Gray, if you've got a bit of time, we might, um, for those of you who want to, we can just um, spend, uh, you know, another 10 minutes or so answering questions after we finish. Um, Stephanie, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Thanks, Gray, for a great talk. Um, I was just wondering about being in um, in dynamic systems my, myself, but from the engineering side, not from the mecha mechanical side. I, I I model physics objects, systems, multi physics objects, but I do model biophysics um, as well. And I see a huge difference that um, the equations in physics are compact and beautiful, as I call it. Um, versus biophysics when you describe um, physiological modeling and, and um, like um, diffusion equations or calcium um, concentrations in a cell, it's just lengthy and ugly. Do you think we, we still have a hidden language that is kind of part of mathematics that we have yet to dis discover? I wouldn't think that we have a hidden language. Um... I think we might have hidden techniques of making things lower dimensional. So, um, I mean, as if we just think about approach, aside from the dynamical systems perspective, now, if we just think about data, when you approach data there with lots of data points, the first thing you would do is, is maybe k-means clustering or something, just a way of grouping lots of data points into, into groups. And that way you have fewer things to think about. You know, if you can group all your millions of data points into three categories, then you only need to think about the interactions between those three categories. Um, in, in my work modeling cognitive processes, um, I take this approach of making things low dimensional. So in, in my models, I like to think, I, in my mind, I picture MRI images and not individual neurons because the whole network of individual neurons is basically trying to do one function. Um, now, from the cognitive science perspective, that's uh, skipping, let's say, a lot of uh, mechanical causes. But at least in theory and in practice, and what I'm hope hopefully doing is trying to show that you can still uh, understand human behavior, while skipping the fine details of all these neurons. When it comes to things like calcium uh, ion channels and, and um, flows and things like this in neurons, I mean, I've also been struck by how high dimensional these systems tend to go the moment they're biological. Um, I think I saw like diet, someone came, came to the university a year or two ago and gave a talk on modeling insulin and what insulin does it in the body. And it was like a 10 year project. And in the first year they had like three variables. And by the time they presented the model to us, they were like, I think there were like 30 variables. Um, so that's 30 equations of interacting things. And it, it's just way too complicated to actually tell anything. Um, and it might be overfitting as well. Um, so I think in, I think there are techniques. I think in, in neuroscience, the neuroscientists have found networks and structures that allow us to reasonably have much lower dimensional systems. Uh, perhaps in your field, those things exist, but haven't yet been uh, realized. I wouldn't say that there's a hidden language though. I think um, they, they just need to be cleverer ways of grouping things together. Um, even if it's a subsystem, one system that describes this process and then that process becomes one variable within a broader equation, breaking it down like that. But yeah, it, it certainly in biology, things tend to be much more complicated and high dimensional. And there's a lot more feedback as well. Everything feedbacks into each other. So there's no closed systems, like none. Like you have to have the whole body or nothing. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, was just, I was going to say, um... I mean, there are some mathematical atheists in the sense that they're constructionists and they don't believe in infinitesimals and infinity. So I suppose that's the closest you would get to a, a mathematical um, atheist. That's a great idea. Yes, I suppose. I suppose the more of a, um, 
I suppose the less of a realist you are, the more of an atheist you are in some sense. Mm. But I don't think anyone would deny the existence of mathematics as a thing. Um, I think for me, I've been moving from realism to less realism as I've read more and more. But, but that's partly because I actually do mathematics. And I feel like the more you do it, kind of, I guess some of the, you know, in a bad way, I think sometimes the wonder gets chipped away in the mystery, but also the, the sense that you're actually making it up as you go along mm. or people are making it up as, as we go along. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks, Gray. It was, um, yeah, fascinating ideas there. Mine one can ask the question about mathematical deists. Just as you had originally deists or God created the universe, gave itself existence and then left, um, it appears to me a lot of people might think mathematics is like that. God created it. It now has an independent existence. It's going on rather than the idea that just as God keeps the physical universe in existence, keeps the relationships and laws of nature going, so too God keeps mathematics and the mathematical functions and ideas going as well. Um, any reactions to that idea of mathematical deism? Um, I would maybe relate this to whether mathematics is part of God's nature or not. Um, as far as I understand, the I can't, okay, I, I might have a bad understanding of this, but the, the kind of physical universe being maintained by God, um, I think of, I think it was Aquinas who had this argument that every cause has another cause and has another cause. And so fundamentally, there must be something which causes everything else that itself is not caused. And that thing must be constant through time and, and that thing would be God. I think that argument doesn't necessarily apply to mathematics on two, for two reasons. The first is that mathematics doesn't seem to have a cause. So, you know, one plus one being, you wouldn't say one plus one causes two. It's just one plus one is two. And so it doesn't necessarily feel like there's something causing that equation to be there, uh, to exist. Um, and, and so I don't know if you can apply that same kind of reasoning. Now, I might have an overly simplified uh, understanding of that argument. The other side of it would be, I don't know if we say, uh, like we say God uh, sustains the universe, the physical universe, but I don't know if we say that God sustains holiness or righteousness. I think we say that God is holiness and is righteousness and is goodness. Um, and I would say that he, he is mathematical. And if that's the case, I don't think he needs to sustain it. I think it's there by his presence, um, by his existence. So I think it's uh, maybe, maybe that's saying the same thing in practice, but it feels slightly different to me. Uh, I think there is a slight difference because, yeah, you, when you talk about holiness, that is part of God's character. But with the physical universe, it's not part of God or part of God's character, hence not pantheism. Uh, it is different, but it, God upholds it. And I'm wondering, is mathematics in that category? Or, like you're saying, is mathematics something to do with God's nature? Uh, yeah, uh, food for thought, all right. Yeah. Thank you very much question. for raising that and other questions. Yeah. Someone else has their hand up, I think. Is that right? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, two questions. Um, one, which I'm not, I'm not really clear about, but I'll... At least I can I can ask them on the business of causation that um, the the, um, the alternative to for mathematics is not the relationship of cause and effect but ground and consequent um, and and so um, um, uh, I, I, all I want to say there I think is I need I need another set of terms like um, where did I first come across this I came across this first in chapter three of C.S. Lewis's Miracles <laughs> um, 
And um, so it, you know, wouldn't you say that something follows from when X follows from Y, um, it's not at all like saying that anything like an effect being caused, it's a different kind of relationship. Uh, this is, I'm not saying this because this isn't any new thought, it's not, but in your talk, I think I needed to hear something about this other kind of relating and perhaps you did say it and I haven't, I didn't pick it up. Um, but it, it um, so that's one thing. The other thing is when you were talking about relationships and numbers, I really was tuned in very strongly there because, but, but I also made a connection to the Christian idea of the triune God. Um, so there's relationships, there's number, there's, am I, is there mathematics? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, stum I'm bumbling around here somewhat. Right. But, but anyway, this just a couple of thoughts. If you had comments, that would be very interesting. I, so. Um, so with the first one, did you say that um, C.S. Lewis called the alternative to cause and effect ground and consequence? Yes, I did say that, okay. and not, and not so much as an alternative as as a as something in the discussion about mathematics and the relationship between mathematical propositions and or reasoning, um, there's an, there's, that's different from cause and effect, uh, even though for, for many, many people, it's, it's physical cause and effect that's the informative <laughs> idea. For right. Pretty well. So um, I kind of, I gave a quote by G.K. Chesterton. So I'm, I'm unfamiliar with, with, this part of miracles. I mean, I think I read miracles, but so long ago. Um, but I, I did, I did give a, that quote by G.K. Chesterton, and in, in his book Orthodoxy, he has a chapter, maybe not a whole chapter, but he has something called the, the test of fairyland. And this, that quote was taken out of that segment of the book. And his basic idea is that in fairy tales, you can have a whole bunch of stuff happen that make certain people say, oh, that's so unrealistic, you know, because fairies fly around and whatever, uh, you know, you, the pumpkin can become a carriage and things like this. And his point is the moment you can, the moment something exists in fairyland, then you know it to be more true than the stuff which can be different in fairyland. Um, so he used the example of the apple hitting Newton's nose and he says, well, when the apple hits his nose, the nose is also hitting the apple, Newton's third law. And we can't imagine it being otherwise. So he calls that a mental relationship and not just a physical repetition um, where he would say that gravity would be something that we just observe. It just repeats itself. It's just a, what he called a weird repetition. Um, but we can imagine gravity not working. We can imagine that apple falling and then taking off like in my little gif um so what i would say is that on, in the physical repetitions we have cause and effect we have things causing each other but we very frequently probably most of the time kind of can imagine the one cause having a different effect however in mathematics that tends not to be the case uh we very seldom well firstly we don't really have causes mm -hmm. but even if we had that kind of idea we very seldom can imagine a mathematical statement being turning into anything other than it is. If you took mathematics from Earth and you put it into a fairy tale, the mathematics would still be the same. You know, if the witch has three blind mice and they were in this world, the, the three would be the same three, regardless of yeah, which sure, universe sure, they were in. Sure. Yes, indeed. Indeed. I guess I guess what I'm asking about, thank you for the clarification, is when when in mathematics when reasoning, rigorous thinking, you say that something follows from something else. What does that mean? So that would be, it would be what a deductive reasoning, but it, you wouldn't, when you say something follows from, <laughs> it's a very good question. You aren't <laughs> saying that the one statement is causing the other statement. Again, it's, it's this mental relation. There's sure. the, 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 re the relationship between the definitions of those two things um, is, is limited yeah. because 
in some sense, what I would say is that they're made up objects. So because you've defined these objects, these made up things, so that they have particular properties, so that they have certain relationships between each other, you're very limited in, in the direction that they could follow in, in the um, kind of idea of C.S. Lewis. So when something follows on from another thing, what you're really saying is, it's the only thing that could follow on from this. It's the only conclusion. It's the strictest form yeah. of, you know, preposition A and and, and preposition B um, yields the conclusion. But, but obviously that also depends on which type of proof you're looking at. And there are many different types of mathematical proof and some of them might have different ways of conceiving following on. So it's, so it's the, the relationship of following on um, that I'm, I'm, I'm interested, not, well, not right now, but I'm interested in unpacking. And, and as, as you're indicating, that could, it's not, there's not just one sense of following on, but it's certainly not something like um, um, one ball following from another having been struck by it. It's, not, it's a yes. quite different sense of following. And, an interesting uh, sense of, but so thank you. Yes, thank you for that. So as, I mean, I, I had the picture of the, the honeycombs and I think that's an interesting example because um, actually there, there might be better examples. So there's um, a species of uh, cicada that lives in North America that has life cycles of prime numbers. So um, they'll all be born either generally in the 13th year or the 17th year after the previous season of being born, but sometimes the 11th year or sometimes it can be any prime number, but it tends, the average seems to be about 13. And that's kind of fascinating. I mean, why prime numbers, right? And it seems like the mathematical explanation would be that all the predators that eat the cicadas don't have prime life cycles. So if you're trying to dodge all the predators, then you want something prime so that you're not falling into the same birth cycle as all the same predators over and over. Now, there you see that there's a kind of biological explanation through the theory, through evolution, but there's also a mathematical explanation that doesn't, you wouldn't say the mathematical explanation is causing the yeah. survivors to be born on prime number years, it's, but it's providing an explanation that's different to the biological yes. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. so the, the, the birth cycle kind of follows on from the mathematical idea, <laughs> but I, I don't know how to use the word follow on there precisely. So. That's good, it <laughs> makes it even more interesting. <laughs> yeah, and Thank then you. regarding the triune God, um, I wouldn't put too much weight on that being a mathematical state. I wouldn't say, you know, um, uh, God's nature is mathematical because there's a triune God or, or anything like that. I mean, I, I think that is is much oh, deeper uh, about relationship and, and love um, than about number. Um, but obviously, in ancient cultures, number and numerology was incredibly important, and um, yeah, and very symbolic. And in, in a sense, number was often worshipped, for example, by the ancient Greeks. So. I guess I wasn't, I was thinking numbers in relationship, God in relationship, uh, God is three and God is one. Um, uh, it's self a difficult moment, perhaps, but but um, on the other hand, the, the, you're talking about numbers and relationship did resonate. Uh, the, quite what the resonance is with uh, the understanding of the triune God. Well, that's another question. That's, that's uh, you know, that's I'll take a night or two on that, but um, but 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 the resonance at least suggests connection, which which is interesting. So, yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, Gray, thank you so much. It's um, you've obviously done so much reading apart from your mathematics, and it's just made for such an amazingly interesting um, talk tonight. And and we could go on for hours, but we all have to go other places. So, I asked um, Don if you would please um, help us to finish in prayer, thank you. May the vast reservoir of your creative wisdom, infinite God, flow through us and energize us for our vocations 
that we would be guided by your spirit, inspired, just like the writers and editors of scripture, which you intended us to have. May we therefore partake of you and encounter you, creating, judging, healing, recreating in the personal presence of Jesus Christ. Thank you for what we have learned tonight and bless Gray. Draw close to us when we are lonely, when we are perplexed and encourage us within and through this organization and your many people throughout your world. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.